he is one of the central holistic practitioners in the world and founded the functional medicine movement. He has influenced doctors around the globe with his innovative and groundbreaking ideas. And the latest one is creating a movement called Big Bold Health. He's here to talk to us about the four R's in getting your gut healthy and also rejuvenating your gut, which is basically your immune system. So please welcome Dr. Jeffrey Bland. Hi well, there, thank Dr. you, Lynn. Good to, good to see you both. Thanks so much. What a, what a treat. It's so great. Let's start out with what are the four R's? Yeah, thank you. This uh, it started off actually as three R's, um, and then we, we, you know, we, we had the reproduction of R's, so it became four R's. And actually, now the Institute for Functional Medicine is teaching it as a five R. So I don't know what that means, but we seem to keep adding R's. But uh, the four R's, which is where kind of I, I, I guess my number of R's stopped. Um, the first R is remove, and I'll describe what each of these R's mean in a second. Uh, the second R is replace. The third R is re-inoculate. And the fourth R is repair. And uh, the, the fifth R, I'll just throw this out from the functional medicine new alliteration, is uh, rebalance. So, but, but for, as far as I'm concerned, the four R's are probably where the central portion of the intervention lies. So let's, let's review what those four R's mean. Um, repair, excuse me, a, a remove, uh, which is the first R, has to do with uh, taking away the things that might cause significant uh, disruption of gastrointestinal function. So that would be uh, parasites, molds, bacteria, viruses, uh, toxins, uh, pesticides, uh, 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 empty calorie foods. So you, you basically first look at the things that a person may be consuming that would be contributing to a dysfunction of their gut and the microbiome. So that would be remove. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's kind of a wholesale review of how a person, what, what is a person passing through this 26 foot long piece of plumbing called the gastrointestinal tract as what they eat and, and drink. Um, so the second R then is uh, replace. And uh, replace has to do with the fact that uh, many individuals uh, uh, who have digestive difficulties are suffering from things like chronic pancreatic insufficiency, meaning they have digestive enzyme uh, insufficiencies from their uh, exocrine pancreas. They can't digest protein particularly or fats. Um, and so uh, what we say is we need to replace then those enzymes uh, by uh, supplementation using uh, different types of digestive enzyme preparations. Or uh, the other part of replace is they have what's called hypochlorhydria. And that means that the uh, cells of their stomach lining, the parietal cells, are not secreting enough stomach acid to uh, properly uh, activate the digestive process because our process of digestion is really dependent upon what's called acidifying the chyme. The chyme is kind of the digested food material partially digested. And that has to be uh, acidified by the release of these, uh, of actually hydrochloric acid by the parietal cells that line our stomach. And if, the, if those uh, cells have undergone um, loss uh, of their function over time, which is not a, 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 a uncommon actually, particularly as people grow older, then their ability to acidify is reduced, and that then means when those uh, when it goes down south into the lower intestine, the so-called the duodenum and the small intestine, that it doesn't stimulate the proper release of uh, of enzymes. So now you get this problem of maldigestion, and uh, the the big stuff in our food is not broken down to the small stuff properly, and that can lead to to food for bacteria and cause dysbiosis. So the, the second R. Uh, replace means uh, do we need to have that person take digestive enzymes and also some form of acid. We generally would use things like betaine hydrochloride, which is a, uh, a dietary supplement form of hydrochloric acid. The third R then is re-inoculate. And re-inoculate is uh, related to putting back the friendly uh, bacteria in our microbiome 
And uh, here we really talk about prebiotics and probiotics uh, as being the kind of uh, third R. So prebiotics would be non-digestible forms of carbohydrate that stimulate friendly bacteria. Um, these could be uh, oligofructans or different types of uh, non-digestible uh, carbohydrate that is specific to be the food of friendly bacteria. And then we also then would use certain uh, probiotics that are also able to stimulate uh, friendly uh, um, microbe. And then uh, the last uh, R, which is repair, is once we've got the, the system working correctly, now we've got probably an injured GI mucosa, this uh, very sensitive one cell thick lining that covers our intestinal tract. We need to repair it because you probably have some state of what we call leaky gut. That's a term that we actually kind of invented back in the 1980s, early 80s, which I'm very proud to say now leaky gut is in this in the standard literature. Gastroenterologists use this. And, you know, at first people pushed back on that term and and we got a lot of criticism and criticism from the medical side when we first started talking about leaky gut and dysbiosis. But but now these have kind of come terms that people use in general. And so uh, to repair the gut mucosa, we think of uh, things like zinc and vitamin E, essential fatty acids, uh, uh, vitamin D, um, uh, with various uh, phytochemicals like quercetin. Uh, and so there's a whole formulaic uh, approach then towards repairing uh, the, the gut mucosa. And that combination of those four steps, those four R's, is what we call gastrointestinal restoration. It restores a healthy gut function, which then helps to restore healthy immune function because uh, as you already indicated, uh, more than 50% of our body's immune system is clustered around our intestinal tract. So when you're improving your gut uh, function, you're uh, by, by combination, you're improving your immune function as well. Okay. Is there a T before the R's in terms of testing to see that it is a, a, a gut dysbiosis? Yes, you know, that uh, is another kind of chapter in our story over the years, um, and Dr. Leo Gallen was really very instrumental in uh, uh, starting us down the road in developing some presumptive laboratory tests. Uh, I was involved uh, in, the, in the early 80s in, in a company called Great Smokies Diagnostic Labs that, that started uh, with, with Dr. Gallen to develop what was called the Comprehensive Digestive Stool Analysis, and um, this was kind of a a novel concept when I think back uh, to its early development, uh, Dr. Stephen Berry was part of the, the founding of that company and Dr. Marty Lee. And um, what we were doing during those early days was to, to try to find a way by using the stool as an interrogation tool for what was happening upstream in the digestive system. So we could culture the stool looking for various types of microbes uh, that might be associated with toxicity. We could look for debris of food that was suggestive of incomplete uh, digestion, incomplete protein digestion and fat digestion. We could look at various enzymes to look at uh, how the digestive enzymes were being released by the pancreas. And so that what we, we called the CDSA, that was the abbreviation Comprehensive Digestive Stool Analysis, became I think the first uh, presumptive test for evaluating gastrointestinal function and that was in the early 80s and now that's kind of grown up into a much more broad series of diagnostic tools and many labs are offering that uh, and I take some pride that uh, you know we were involved really with pioneering that first uh, level of testing at first again a lot of doctors push back said who in the world would ever want to measure stool that's kind of a yucky thing to have to worry about and yeah. maybe it is yucky but you can find a lot of information uh, out of a stool sample in terms of gastrointestinal function. Yeah, it's interesting that you you mentioned a number of things, factors there, from parasites through to pollutants, etc. I mean, other speakers have spoken quite a lot about gluten and dairy, which you didn't raise quite so significantly. Uh, where does that sit, in your opinion, on 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 bad gut problems? Well, thank you, and that that was kind of my oversight because I should have mentioned those in my in my list. Uh, yeah. But I, I believe that um, sometimes uh, you know when we find certain things that are problematic in, in gluten and uh, beta caseomorphins case that are found in dairy products are two problem uh, critters. But not everybody is sensitive to those, and uh, and so uh, you know I I should have put them on the list, but I. 
I think, uh, again, we believe very strongly in this concept of biochemical individuality and, and no two people are identical. And so I, I'm, I think we got a little bit on the bandwagon here uh, the last few years saying, you know, implying that everybody is, is reactive to gluten and everybody is reactive to dairy. And, and I don't believe that's true. Uh, you know, having 40 years of experience in this field and running a laboratory, uh, I, I would say that these are things we need to be very sensitive to in terms of our assessment, but I don't think we should assume that every person is intolerant to, uh, uh, to gluten-containing grains or to uh, casein-containing dairy products. By the way, I think that there is also with the gluten story, as with uh, as Dr. Alessio Fasano, who I think we would all regard as one of the world's experts in this area of gluten sensitivity, <laughs> his work that he's, he's uh, recently done in Harvard, uh, Mass General, would, would suggest again that uh, it may be not just gluten in and of itself that's creating some of this grain sensitivity that we're seeing so prevalently, uh, that it may be uh, the cultivars of the grain that have other uh, antigenic substances in the grains other than just um, uh, gluten itself that you know we've hybridized our grains so much particularly in the United States with uh, crossbreeding and trying to get certain properties into the grains that would make them either higher yield or better for baking or whatever that we've introduced uh, certain kinds of uh, principles that were not in the original uh, cultivars and you know it's it's very often I people will say you know I go to Italy and I uh, I eat grains there in pasta and I don't have any problem at all I come back to America and I have problems. So I think we have to be very mindful of, uh, sometimes we use a term, we just say it's gluten, but it may be much more complex than gluten. It could even be things that are uh, trace contaminants in, in grains that are grown, say, in the United States, where we have a lot of herbicides being used on our crops. And it could be some of those uh, residues that also contribute to some of the sensitivity. So I I want to be a little cautious when I just throw the term gluten out because some people may think that everybody needs to be on a grain-free diet, and I don't think that's necessarily true. Right. right. No, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, while we're talking about allergens too, or allergens or intolerances, can people get over them, or do you find that people who are tend to be allergic to whatever it is, anything from you know gluten to nickel? Um, will always be allergic to it. That is uh, a fantastic question, and <laughs> to particularly ask in this day and age where we're starting to actually uh, understand some of the sophisticated nature of our immune system in ways that we didn't previously understand. Um, so let's use just as an example for, for this uh, peanut allergy. And... Uh, this, in, in the extreme case of peanut allergy, as we know, can be really a serious life-threatening situation for children. And uh, they can have anaphylactic shock from exposure to even the smallest trace can, you know, material of peanuts left mm -hmm. in, in, you know, as a contaminant. Um, but now we start recognizing, and, and you probably have seen this literature, even in you know, high-tier medical journals like the New England Journal of Medicine, are studies that are being published saying that children that have the genetic susceptibility to peanut allergy can be desensitized to peanut allergy by exposing them to low levels of peanut antigens, retraining their immune system. It's almost like immunizing them against peanuts for which they have a serious potential for allergy. Mm -hmm. And I think this concept of the adaptive immune system and how it can learn and how it can be retrained is a very, very fascinating emerging chapter in our understanding of how to both, how both allergy is produced and then maybe how we neutralize allergy with desensitization and retraining of the immune system. Now, I want to be cautious as I, as I you know, say this because certainly if a person has a very severe uh, allergy and you know maybe even to the extent that they would have anaphylactic shock or they would get respiratory problems that could be serious. Uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting they suddenly expose themselves to something uh, to uh, test their immune system. What I'm saying is in cases where individuals have modest to mild forms of food sensitivity that by improving gut immunological function 
and retraining or rebooting the immune system because it can be rejuvenated. It can learn new lessons. Just as muscles can be trained on a fitness program, the immune system can be retrained on a uh, uh, the appropriate health information system because food is information, right? Food is not just calories. Food is not vitamins and minerals alone. And it's, it's actually information that speaks to cells to create their personality. That's called the epigenetics of how we regulate our function. And so what you want to send is the right information to the immune system to retrain it to be your friend rather than your foe. And that to me is the front edge of this extraordinary revolution that's now occurring uh, as to how we can, uh, just as, a, as we physically fit train our bodies, we can immunologically train our bodies and rejuvenate its function. Mm. Now, when you're saying desensitize, are you talking about the neutralizing type of desensitization that has been around for a couple of decades? Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that would be the first kind of uh, step into this this new science, because uh, that, that was more, more coming from a clinical observation. Uh, Ru uh, Dr. Rudolph uh, at the University of Illinois uh, Medical School, in Chicago, actually uh, kind of pioneered uh, uh, that and, and Dr. Theron Randolph was very involved in, in this as well. And uh, these these concepts of desensitization came from empirical studies that, that docs did, allergists and immunologists, that could, they, they could desensitize using very small amounts of different antigens. But now we're actually learning a little bit more about the mechanism. How does that really relate to the T helper cells and to the and to the, uh, the natural killer cells and to the uh, macrophages of the innate immune system. What, what are you really doing to the personality of these cells that govern how we respond to our environment? And what are the right ways of, of uh, personalizing this approach uh, to an individual so you can get their immune system to be on their, to be a friend rather than a foe? Because we see, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, certain people who become so sensitive to their diet that virtually it seems like they're reacting to everything. And, um, and, and now you say, well, what, how did you get a pan allergy? You know, you, your body shouldn't do that. It, it must mean your immune system has turned hostile on you. And why is that? Then you have to, to look at the whole nature. Once again, the four hour program is part of that. You look at uh, the first hour removed, maybe they're exposed to some uh, toxic substances completely put their immune system on guard like lead or mercury or cadmium or, uh, arsenic, uh, which is another problem for our immune system. So, you know, it, it, it sends you on a detective mission to really search for where the problem uh, originates. Mm. Um, that's just so interesting, though, that they're taking that whole neutralization, desensitization one stage further for the mechanism is the same, though. It's just yes. getting that neutralizing dose that uh, it's that they find that certain dosages of the substance will turn off the reaction, is that right, of the immune system. So it's just locating that neutralizing dose and then getting uh, multiple, just tiny injections. I think it's... Exactly, yes. Muscular injections or something like that, and then eventually the person is just, is, is no longer reacting to the substance. Mm. Okay, so as part of the REMOVE program, Jeff, I mean, is it purely testing or do you go on a, 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 a limitation diet as well to try and figure out what's yes. going on? That's, that's another really, uh, really great point. Um, clinically, um, you know, so much we learned from our early pioneers, uh, and what it, for me early means in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. um, and it's, the construct of going to a fundamental oligoantigenic diet. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, what it means is trying to take away all potential agents that might be uh, allergic producing. Now you say, well, but just a second, uh, Jeff, because didn't you just say earlier that maybe there is no such thing as a completely non-allergic substance that you could find one person somewhere in the world that was allergic to something you thought was not allergic. And because we have this diversity of, of difference from people to people. And so that is a little bit of the, uh, the rub that we have certain food families that we know are much more commonly allergy producing. And then we, we can say these foods are generally safe, but no food is completely safe for every person because we know that there's a, such a diversity of response. 
But with that said, the early uh, clinical pioneers, when they said, okay, the way we're going to test is we're going to put you, say, on a uh, fast for a couple of days so that uh, we kind of eliminate all information from foods and your body's immune system kind of goes to rest. Then we're going to challenge you with one food at a time. And uh, we'll go through this uh, provocation testing. Uh, so it's elimination provocation. And then we'll see how you uh, respond. And I think that that, having myself started doing that in the 70s with patients in, in our clinic, uh, is very, very enlightening. Because a person might say to you, oh, I know I'm not allergic to that food because I eat it all the time. And I don't seem to have a problem. But then you eliminate and provoke by reintroducing it. And suddenly they get all these symptoms. They get headaches and they get stuffy nose and they have digestive upset and they get head. You know, they just mm. are having a reaction. So I, I think that uh, the elimination provocation concept is one that we, we've used. The difficulty, or not difficulty, the challenge with that is that... Um, it can be kind of a lengthy procedure. If you say, you know, you're going to use one food at a time and you say, okay, well, what, how much of a washout do you need between each food before you introduce the next one? So you're not interfering one with the other. Then you say, well, that probably should be at least a half a day between each food. Uh, so that means two foods a day. And maybe you want to have 20 foods that you like to test. It means you're going to be on a, on a 10 day kind of semi fasting regime, which for many people is way too, Mm. Um, demanding. So you, we generally distill that down maybe into just the five major food families that are allergy producing if that person eats those in their diet. If they don't eat those in their diet, then we say, well, we're, well let's not test those because that's not mm. something they're going to have a problem with. Mm. So that, that elimination provocation testing uh, procedure, um, I think is a very useful clinical um, assessment uh, procedure. Mm. What are the five families, by the way? Well, I think we, we obviously are the two that you already mentioned, the, the grain family with gluten and the dairy with, uh, with casein. Uh, then we go to uh, citrus, shellfish, yeast, eggs. Um, let's see, what have I missed in my five? Uh, soy? Soy, yeah, and then soy would be in that, the legume family. So, and I think those would be the principal uh, top, top, mm -hmm. Food families. Are, are there any completely safe foods? Well, again, as I say, uh, we can pick out certain things that we think are safe. Uh, we've done a tremendous amount of work over the years with uh, with rice and rice protein. Mm -hmm. And in the Western world, where we're, rice is not the principal food that we consume, uh, it's generally considered very, very safe. If it's rice, it doesn't have contamination with uh, pesticides or herbicides. Um, and so we've done a lot with rice protein concentrate as kind of our, the, in fact, I, this is what I, where I started in this field, actually, I tried to develop an oligoantigenic food that we could use as kind of the base for this type of testing. And uh, this is work that uh, I did in the 80s. I, yeah, it was in the 80s. Uh, we, we developed actually this, this, this food product as an alternative to Vivanex. You probably, um, maybe that's not a name that's in England. It's uh, in, in the in a in the states, uh, Vivanex V I V O N E X is a, a protein hydrolysate um, food that is used for uh, hyperallergic patients, and mm -hmm. it's basically a very low allergy formulation that's been pre-digested, except it tastes ghastly. I mean, literally, it could gag a horse, and um, and so you have to be pretty darn sick to be able to use to tolerate Vivanex. <laughs> so we, we developed a, a more tolerable form of, of that uh, for testing uh, that we called Ultra Clear uh, back in the 80s. And it was a rice-based material that people could tolerate. Mm. Right. And, and when on, on the part of the remove protocols, Jeff, if it's not food, you mentioned a lot about chemicals, other pollutants as well. Is, do you use collation to, to remove those? <laughs> Excuse me. I think the best way of uh, getting, uh, well, there's, first of all, there's, there's two broad families of, of toxins. Uh, one are the lipophilic toxins, the fat-soluble toxins that are small molecules that are called xenobiotics, uh, that are uh, remnants from the petrochemical age in which we live. <laughs> so they could be any, any number of tens of thousands of different uh, chemicals that are organic. Uh, when I say organic, meaning they're they're derived from 
the element carbon. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there's the, uh, the, the other, the, the, the toxic mineral family. And the toxic mineral family, the lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, aluminum, that, that family um, requires a different approach for detoxification. So let's first talk about the, uh, um, the organic materials, the ones that are uh, xenobiotics derived from chemical pollutants. Um, the way you get rid of those generally is to try to make sure that the, the liver and the gastrointestinal detoxifying enzymes are really working uh, functionally. And this is a, another area that we spent quite a bit of time uh, in the 90s working on the so-called metabolic detoxification. How do you get your, your body's uh, detoxifying machinery to work properly? And it, it turns out that uh, the body really has uh, two kinds of, uh, of enzymes. These are called the cytochrome P450s. Uh, they're found in high level in the liver. The liver is an important detoxifying organ. And then the second family of enzymes are called the conjugase enzymes. And so what happens is your body, um, that when exposed to a foreign uh, lipophilic or fat-soluble toxin, it, uh, because fats don't dissolve in, the body, in, the wa in water very well, and the body has that intelligence to know if it's going to have to get rid of that, it's going to have to make it more water-like because that's how our body urinates it away or puts it into the feces. So to make a fat-soluble molecule into a water-soluble byproduct, it, uh, it goes through this enzyme system called the cytochrome P450s. Uh, many of those enzymes uh, are actually inducible, meaning they can be activated through sp uh, specific uh, dietary uh, principles, uh, things like glucosinolates that are found in cruciferous vegetables. So broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage contain these phytochemicals um, like indole 3 carbonyl sulforaphane, uh, that activate the phase one enzymes to be more able to convert fat soluble substances, toxins into water soluble substances. Um, the conversion into more water soluble substances, however, has a little um, uh, secondary issue you have to deal with, however, and those water soluble derivatives from the fat soluble toxins sometimes can be more toxic than the stuff they started with. So the body has the intelligence to know that. And so what it does is it before it delivers those water-soluble derivatives into the body, it has a second enzyme system called the conjugases that put a handle on that material to make it safer for the body to uh, metabolize and excrete. Hmm. So the conjugase enzymes uh, are also activated uh, by specific nutrients like elagic acid from, from grapes and berries or uh, uh, epigallocatechin gallate, which is a uh, principle in green tea. So we, we have this two-phase system mm. that our body uses to eliminate toxins. And what we find in many individuals is that there is uh, an interruption or a defect or a, a lower than optimal function so there's where we, we put a person through a metabolic detoxification program using these nutrients, these plant-derived nutrients to activate their detox systems. So that's, that's the toxic chemical side. On the other side of the toxic metal sides that I mentioned, the, oh, what do you do there? And there's where chelation uh, comes to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most important um, chelator uh, of all uh, in the body is a natural chelator that the body makes uh, to bind heavy metals and to coat them in a, in a coating that allows them to be excreted. And uh, this uh, particular uh, molecule is, uh, is very, very high in the element sulfur. Um, sulfur comes from the amino acids cysteine and methionine, and it turns out that sulfur uh, binds these heavy metals very well. Uh, and so you can activate this uh, natural chelating agent uh, also uh, to be produced in higher levels. And, and we, we spent quite a bit of time in the 90s actually looking, uh, screening various, actually hundreds of different plant foods to see which plant foods might most uh, able to activate. Um, it's, it's the substance called metallothionine um, is the name of the chemical the body makes that is high in sulfur. It has the highest sulfur content of any protein that the body makes. And it's specifically designed to to help chelate uh, naturally these materials and, and help them to be eliminated out of the body. So uh, we have, uh, you know, using precision nutrition, we have ways of actually uh, uh, 
defining in, in individual approaches towards uh, detoxification and improving, uh, getting rid of uh, the burden of, of toxins. Hmm. How do you do, what foods are highest in that or what supplements are highest in that for those two detox paths? Uh, well, first of all, for the, uh, the, the, the phase one, phase two uh, enzymes that, that get rid of uh, chemical toxins, the fat soluble toxins, mm -hmm. Uh, as I mentioned, the cruciferous vegetable family, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, Brussels sprout uh, being really good, broccoli sprouts being really good. What about so, if? What about uh, supplements? If if for some reason it's not activating enough, are there any supplements that uh, that essentially crank up that process? Yeah, yeah. I three C and O three carbonyl is a supplement. Uh, Sulfurafane is a very popular self, uh, supplement uh, mm -hmm. that that does that. Um, a uh, dim di uh, wheel methane is another supplement that is used uh, for that process. Um, these are things that um, most all of the practitioners that are doing natural therapeutics are very familiar with these supplements that are used for this detox process. Mm -hmm. And how about metals, heavy metals? Are there natural substances, substances that are good chelators too? You said that the body can do this, but is there something else to crank that up? Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, in the gut, uh, the use of alginates. Um, so these are uh, uh, non-digestible carbohydrates derived from seaweed. So the few tans that you often find with various brown and red seaweeds. Um, we, we also recognize that uh, fructooligosaccharides that are found in uh, uh like uh, chicory and Jerusalem arch artichoke, um, those are good natural chelators as well of mm -hmm. heavy metals. Uh, then we get to the sulfur-containing foods like uh, onions and garlic, the allium family that uh, has uh, you know higher sulfur content. Uh, so those are all uh, kind of examples of, of foods that are used uh, for metal toxic toxicity. Mm -hmm. What about things like chlorella? That has been touted in various products and and people putting that into smoothies. Does that work? Well, chlorella, again, is a very high phytochemically dense um, product. And those phytochemicals, uh, chlorophyll being obviously one because uh, of the color, uh, we know we have a lot of chlorophyll in, the, in it. And those chemicals, um, those phytochemicals, those plant-derived chemicals, participate in the uh, activation of these detox processes that I've been mentioned. So it's another another tool, another uh, supplement tool that can be used for supporting uh, detoxification. Okay, so we've, we've kind of gone through the first R. Let's go to the second. Yeah, so that's replace. Um, and uh, this is another very interesting area. If you talk to a traditional gastroenterologist uh, and you talk about uh, pancreatic insufficiency, um, they would tell you, well, at least historically they would tell you, I think things are changing now, they would tell you that your body either makes enough enzymes for digestion or it doesn't. There's nothing in between. You either have a pancreatic disease of e exocrine pancreatic insufficiency or you have normal digestion and there's nothing in between. Um, now, we recognize, uh, well, well, actually, <laughs> I'll, I'll pat our, our colleagues on the back, here, back a little bit. We recognized, <laughs> you know, uh, 40 years ago uh, that that's not true. It's a gradation between, you know, complete uh, sufficiency uh, of pancreatic enzyme capability and ins complete insufficiency. There's a gradation. Now, the reason that um, I think gastroenterologists would uh, used to say that it was either you had a problem or, or you didn't, there was nothing in between, was that they recognized that the amount of acid that's secreted by healthy people after eating a steak dinner, for instance, is many times greater than the amount of acid that you really need to acidify the chyme. So they would say there's a reserve. They would also say the same thing about the pancreas producing enzymes. They would say the pancreas will produce many more enzymes that are necessary that to break down that meal. Uh, and in a, in a totally healthy, uh, functionally intact individual, uh, that is true, that we have this organ reserve, that our body produces more than is what needed for base function. But in a, in a compromised individual whose health is not fully operating as they would like it to, 
uh, there is there is a reduction in the ability to secrete these particular substances from either the parietal cells of the stomach or the pancreatic enzymes from the endocrine, endocrine panc uh, exocrine pancreas. And in those cases, they end up with not a frank deficiency, but an insufficiency. And by the way, what I just talked about, the difference between deficiency and insufficiency is a general um, concept that applies virtually to all aspects of nutrition. Uh, historically, people uh, believed that you either had enough of a substance, let's say vitamin C, to prevent scurvy and so you were sufficient, or you had scurvy, and there was nothing in between. Mm. And, and now we recognize that uh, the difference between deficiency and sufficiency can be very different than used to be thought, because there's an intermediary called insufficiency before you get to deficiency. And so that insufficiency can vary itself dramatically from person to person based on their own individual uniqueness. So to set a rule to say, if you get 20 milligrams of vitamin C a day, you will not get scurvy, therefore you're sufficient, is absolutely incorrect relative to the measurement of what vitamin C does across over 1200 metabolic functions related to sufficiency. And many people are insufficient even if they're not having scurvy. Mm -hmm. So I can, use, I can use that same model for virtually anything in nutrition that you want to discuss. There's a, uh, some things have a wider range between sufficiency and insufficiency than others, uh, but all nutrients and all aspects of our body goes through this, this range of effects. Um, and so it's not just like an on-off switch where you're either perfectly healthy or you're sick. There's this big thing in between that we call insufficiency. Mm. And, and it drives the RDA as well, of course. And people will take these minimum doses, which has no therapeutic value. That, that's exactly right. And, and then, then it comes down to asking the question. So I'm going back now to, to Lynn's question about uh, the second R and, and pancreatic and, and parietal cell sufficiency. So what do gastroenterologists say today uh, about this versus when we started off, I started off 40 years ago? And 40 years ago, uh, was it 40 years? Yeah, oh my word, that's scary to even think. It was 40 years ago. There was a paper that was published by two very well-known gastroenterologists at the Mayo Clinic, which in the States is considered one of the premier medical centers. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was uh, uh, DeMagno and Graham, uh, two very high esteemed uh, gastroenterologists. And what they studied were pancreatic enzyme uh, sufficiencies in individuals who had different digestive problems. And they published this paper and said, well, gee whiz, you know, we're finding when we do this work that uh, people that we, we didn't think had pancreatic disease, uh, some of these people don't have pancreatic sufficiency <laughs> there there and so we started we then tested they then tested a variety of different commercially available pancreatic enzyme digestive tablets and they found uh, a very significant difference from some of these they were all labeled the same they were called pancreatin uh, and some were very active uh, when they were used uh, orally and some which were labeled the same were very inactive and so they then said, well, if you're going to start treating in pancreatic insufficiency, you better use a preparation that has a demonstrated uh, adequate potency of these digestive enzymes. I'm, I'm actually amazed in the States within the last two years, and I want, I want, again, just to put a historical marker here, that we started this discussion 40 years ago. <laughs> so in the last two years in the States, there are now advertisements for consumers on TV and radio ads talking about this new con condition called yeah. pancreatic insufficiency, mm -hmm. that you should take this little test this, uh, to see if you could be a candidate. The test is a, you, a questionnaire saying, you know, the 10 questions related to your digestive uh, capabilities. And if you score poorly on this test, uh, then you're, you should go to your doctor and ask them, do you have pancreatic insufficiency? And if so, there's a, there's a drug that this company now is producing, which happens to be pancreatin, pancreatic right. in digestive aid, that we've been talking about for 40 years. So, you know, sometimes it takes a while to uh, no, work, work its way through.
I mean, well, we remember, we remember when we started What Doctors Don't Tell You. We we actually started it because I had a case of candida and a and a bad microbiome. And at the time, uh, the person I finally went to, Dr. Stephen Davies, was Oh my word. Oh yeah. <laughs> there is one of my great colleagues. Oh uh, he, us, he, yeah. you know, he healed me and the stuff that he was doing was yes. revolutionary at the time, as was yours. Tell me something. What about well, well, I, well? Actually, let me just say a word to that. I want to give a shout out to to Stephen. So um, he's an Australian now, as far as I know. But um, uh, he was one of the original, along with Damian Downing and and Leo Gallen and uh, Sid Baker and Marty Lee and, and Stephen Berry and uh, I could name some other names. But these were all the kind of uh, renegade uh, people. Uh, they got together early on. Uh, Gene Monroe was another one in England, uh, Dr. Monroe, um, that really uh, we then invited uh, in 1988 uh, to come to Victoria, Vancouver Island um, in British Columbia, Canada, for what we, my wife actually was the one that advocated this, to have a white more discussion about what would medicine be if we took away reimbursement, we took away licensure and we just asked what's the best form of therapy that we could think of uh, in an idealized medical world and that's what led to the development in that in those meetings because we did a second meeting the following year 1989 and that was where i came up with the idea of functional medicine mm -hmm. out of that discussion uh -huh. so these yeah. people we're talking we're talking you're talking about are people that were all part of that original uh mm -hmm. group of thinkers that led into this development mm -hmm. absolutely and of course dr stephen davies created Biolab, which does Jesus. testing, you know, and tests to this day, even though he's in Australia, his, his London-based lab lives on. Tell me something about when you're testing for digestive enzymes and um, stomach acid, et cetera, what kind of good tests do you think um, show uh, important results? And do you like particular labs? Do you rate particular labs now? Well, I think there are two kinds of tests uh, in general um, kind of uh, construction. One are uh, tests that measure uh, the phenotype of an individual. So what does that mean? That measures their, how, they, how they respond at a physiological level, um, at a whole body level. So if, if you're talking about digestive testing, something like the digestive um, stool analysis, looking at undigested uh, food particles in the stool would be an example of a phenotypic test because it implies there's something upstream that's not working right, right? Because if you think of what goes out the south end, that's the downstream. Upstream is what happened to it when it was in the digestive process. And so if it's not completely broken down, you, you assume then that there's an insufficiency. So that would be a phenotypic test. Then you say, well, what other kinds of tests are? What's the other family? The other family are functional physiological tests. So you could then measure in the stool what is the presence of certain enzymes like elastase or protease enzymes that are more related specifically to the function of that organ involved with digestion. And you would say, based on the appearance or the absence of these enzymes in the stool, there is a, a insufficiency or a sufficiency of digestion. So you, you couple those the, that that uh, information together to form a pattern of how the person is functioning. And there are labs now, and, and again, I, I, I give a lot of uh, credit to uh, early individuals in this field. Um, uh, I, I actually had a medical laboratory back in the, uh, in the 70s, the Belgrade Redmond Medical Lab that served Dr. Leo Gall, uh, excuse me, Dr. Leo Bowles, who was really the first uh, nutritionally focused medical doctor in, in the Pacific Northwest. And um, we uh, had a, um, a study club uh, back in the 70s. Uh, and that study club um, had Dr. Jonathan Wright in it, uh, and Dr. Joe Pozorno, uh, and, and myself. And our lab director, Ray Soon, uh, then later went with Jonathan Wright as Dr. Wright formed his own lab. And it was really out of Jonathan Wright's lab and our lab was developed in this, the early uh, concepts of the CDSA, which then became Great Smokies in, in uh, North Carolina uh, with Stephen Berry. So there was this evolution over a period of uh, 
of a couple of decades. And, and actually, I, I would give a, a shout out to um, an individual who is a gastroenterologist in Santa Barbara, California, uh, who was the first person that I know of to do stool testing uh, for evaluation of digestive function. And um, he's, he's now deceased. His, his son is actually a doctor and taken over uh, his, his concepts, but he was kind of the teacher for all of us, and, and that includes Stephen Davies and, and John Howard, the, who was the, as you know, the lab director for BioLab. So all of us kind of uh, were collected together around the emergence of these concepts early on. And then that, that, that concept, as it developed and got more uh, use and more application and more refined, uh, then other companies like uh, Doctors Data, uh, Metametrics, many other labs started to um, you employ these uh, tools in their practice in their labs as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So now there are several labs that can do accurate testing like this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you know, while we're on the subject of testing, we talked about uh, elimination diets for allergies. Are there any tests you rate now for actually discovering uncovering allergies or intolerances? Yeah, I, th I think the um, again, I. I there are many companies that are doing really good work, but one that I'm quite familiar with because I have such regard for their scientists, immunologists, uh, developer who's been really a pioneer in our field for, again, 30 plus years, and that's Dr. Aristo Pojani. And uh, his, uh, he had Immunosciences Laboratory that was the earliest uh, application of clinical immunology in our field at a, at a high science level. Uh, that now is kind of uh, his technology and his discoveries have moved over into a, a, a secondary company called Cyrex Laboratory, C-Y-R-E-X. And, mm -hmm. and that really is Dr. Wajani's uh, intellectual uh, contributions now developed into the next level of immune testing. So I think this is really where the frontier is starting to, uh, to, uh, to go. Now I, I have seen that just recently Cyrex has taken the next step forward in helping to understand the personality of the individual immune system through the development of a new testing technology called flow cytometry in which you can measure the activity of individual cells in the immune system. Uh, mm -hmm. And so this, we're getting more and more precise in to be able to define an immuno identity. And I think through that, then we become more precision in how we're going to, to manage individual immune problems. Hmm. Great. How we do we okay, repair? now we've got R. I think well, we've talked about repair in terms of Have we, did we taking, cover that? I think, Everything? Uh, yeah, repair, that? do we need to do more on, uh, we, we talked about pancreatic enzymes and uh, hydrochloric acid. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that was, that was replaced now, right? Oh, that was yeah. replaced. Right. And right. the next one is re right, which yeah. has to do with... So then, there, then there's a big uh, debate that has gone on for some time, and probably it's still to some extent going on now, and that is, is it better to give single species probiotics, or is it better to give multiple species probiotics, and what's, what's the features and benefits of, of each of those? And uh, I think this is a complicated question to take on kind of scientifically, because if you want to look at the effect of an uh, organism, on gut immune function, then you want to take one organism at a time. So you've seen certain species of acid, uh, lactobacillus acidophilus, or, or, or certain species of bifidobacteria. Um, and, and so people argue, well, we have the highest activity form of this particular organism because we've studied it clinically and we know that it has this effect on gastrointestinal function or immune function. And then there are other people who say, well, no, that's actually not the way the gut uh, microbiome works. It works as families of bacteria that work together in concert. And so what you want is a family of friendly bacteria. So you want multi-species probiotics and, uh, and, and then you're going to get a better uh, outcome. Um, the single bacterial species one at a time is more of your kind of a traditional pharmaceutical model where you have just uh, one agent that you're controlling. And the, the family of bacteria uh, is more of your natural model. Um, I think that there are values for each of those. Um, there are certain cases where single species bacteria uh, can be extraordinary, extraordinarily valuable uh, in remediating uh, certain allergic symptoms uh, like ectopic uh, dermatitis in, in infants and children uh, with, with specific bifidobacteria. Um, but then with, when you look at the complexity of an imbalanced dysbiotic gut, 
uh, in, in an older age individual, uh, often the multiple species uh, approach uh, proves to be more beneficial. And there is a little bit of a, uh, a hit and mix and miss empirical nature because not everybody will respond the same way to a probiotic supplement. So sometimes you have to try several and to find the one that really matches that person's um, need. And, and then we, you know, we have also this uh, fecal transplant work that's going on now, and, and which is introducing it from the other end, from the south end rather than the north end. Mm -hmm. And um, with, with the fecal transplant, you're obviously giving multiple bacteria because what you're doing is giving an installation of bacteria from a person that's healthy to re-inoculate the bacteria in a person who is unhealthy. Um, so I think we're still learning a tremendous amount about the therapeutic um, potential of administered bacteria, probiotic bacteria. But one thing I think we can say without question is that uh, you need to make sure that the nutritional environment for whatever bacteria you want to um, uh, administer is, is correct to feed that bacteria. So the prebiotics become, uh, to me, as important and maybe in some cases even more important than the probiotics. And so you ask the question, well, what is a good prebiotic? And here's where the story is, has gotten a little bit more complicated, but I think also it's more instructive. And that is we now find that it's not just solely the non-digestible carbohydrate that is useful as a prebiotic. It's also the presence of specific types of phytochemicals. And we've now recognized that flavonoids and certain members of the, of the, of the polyphenol family, which are the flavonoid family of phytochemicals found in plants, have a favorable effect on uh, establishing prebiotically the friendly bacteria of the microbiome. And th this is kind of an aha because I, I don't think uh, 10 years ago we recognized the important role that the, uh, the, the polyphenols and the flavonoids have in construction of the, of the microbiome and the composition of the microbiome. Now, just recently, and when I say recently, I mean uh, for me a month ago in the um, uh, Nature Medicine Journal, which is, is considered uh, to be a top flight medical journal, uh, two back-to-back -back papers were published that uh, were multi-centered trials in uh, inst uh, investigators from top-level institutions, both in England and in uh, Scandinavia and in uh, in the United States at Harvard. And, uh, and what they were looking at is uh, they, they actually surveyed, 1, 000, I think it was 1,062 uh, individuals that were part of the physician's health study in which they did uh, unbelievably complex analysis of all aspects of their physiology, a metagenomic uh, shotgun analysis of all their microbiome. Um, that would be not just the bacteria, but yeast and, and uh, fungi and uh, viruses. And so they did a complete analysis uh, by using genomic uh, sequencing. Uh, they did an analysis of their uh, blood sugar responses. They did a, a, a complete analysis of their lipids, the, uh, including particle number. Uh, they did a phenotypic analysis of all their symptoms. I mean, it was a very, very complex study trying to ask the question, what is the connection between the diet of these individuals their microbiome and their health. Um, and this is still an ongoing, uh, as you know, a topic of extraordinary interest because we now recognize that certain microbiomes are associated with uh, proper metabolism, good blood sugar regulation and, and insulin sensitivity and improved brown fat metabolism. So these people don't have the tendency to get uh, to store fat in obese, uh, in adipocytes. And other microbiomes are, are those that encourage uh, fat storage and obesity and poor insulin management. So <clears throat> this is not just an academic topic. It turns out it might be the most important <clears throat> topic of all for us to design a good nutrition program against that variable. Because maybe the microbiome is the upstream determinant of what all goes on downstream. And the outcome of this study was, uh, of these two back-to-back -back studies, was quite um, enlightening because they did identify a, out of this complex uh, array of bacteria in the microbiome, they, they identified a bacterium that had not been identified before that was associated with adverse metabolic effects. It was, it was a, a species of uh, Prevotella, um, and it, this particular 
uh, Prevotella um, organism had a very high uh, relationship to the things that we consider with dysbiosis, the, the adverse effects on, on glucose tolerance and the uh, in producing inflammation and increased weight gain. And so um, I think we're starting to just untangle this complex web, this Gordian web of all these interacting variables. Now the question that we would raise uh, obviously is okay, if this, this, this bacterium is not so good, it's associated with, with bad metabolic outcome, whereas things like, uh, uh, oh, one of the mucus uh, stimulating uh, bacteria that's uh, uh, mucinophilia, which is, is associated with positive health attributes, how do you get the positive health attributes, uh, those bacteria to be uh, in proper balance and get, get the ones that are associated with negative effects kind of suppressed? And is it just simply giving a probiotic or is it really are these more reflective of a alteration in the whole gastrointestinal immune system and the gastrointestinal milieu that's going to require more complex dietary intervention? Well, with that in mind, um, and I don't, I, unfortunately, I can't give you the full answer because I think that's still a question that we're learning more about. But we did learn from these studies is that the Mediterranean diet, when properly employed, now there's a lot of different variations on a theme of the Mediterranean diet, but this is one with more olive oil, uh, modest amounts of animal protein, uh, more complex vegetables and fruits, um, uh, some nuts, um, uh, and... Um, Let's see what. Uh, what uh, do they have? Do they? The it, it did. It did. It did have. Uh, yes, it did have some some beans in the in in this dietary approach, and what they found in that case was there was a much there was a favorable shift towards the this complex array of the of the microbiome associated with positive health attributes. So we're starting to get some understanding that the diet can play an important role in certain principles in the diet. Again, this doesn't get down to individuals because it's not as precise, but at least it gives us some general uh, themes from which we can operate. And it also tells us the things that we've already, uh, those of us in this field have already known, like stay away from sugar uh, mm -hmm. and, and stay away from refined carbohydrate. Uh, these, these, are, these are generally not so good. And mm -hmm. even, even though they're still in, in kind of the contemporary nutrition field, some people would say, well, it's all this carbohydrate. What does it matter? You know, but it does matter. The form of it matters. Yes. So, but you talked about poly certain polyphenols feeding the good good gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. Which, which uh, vegetables and fruits uh, would be the best? Well, these are uh, rich in uh, in you know dark green leafy vegetables. They're they're rich in fruits, um, particularly uh, berries. Um, but you find them in apples, you find them in, I mean, the, the nice thing is that they're richly arrayed in virtually every natural, uh, high, unprocessed fruit and vegetable. So if you're eating a, a diet that is more plant-based, you're going to get um, several thousand milligrams of these in your diet on a regular basis. Mm. Fabulous. Just before we go off uh, re-inoculation, um, do you have anything to say about this new helmet the uh, Therapy where they're re reintroducing worms to into the gastric uh, system. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's Dr. Sidney Baker's extraordinary work. Sidney is one of the great thinkers in our field. Um, a former Yale Medical School professor, pediatrician, uh, remarkable thinker, um, and uh, this is part of retraining the immune system. Uh, if you think about this. And this all comes from a, an observation that's been um, accumulating over the last, um, well, as far as I know, the last 30 years, maybe longer than that, but for me, about the last 30 years in the literature. And that is an observation that uh, children who grow up in what we consider developing areas of the world, where hygiene is not as, as prevalent as it is in the Western world, have very, very low incidence of atopic disorders. <clears throat> of allergy, asthma, eczema, the mm -hmm. things that we see much more commonly in uh, westernized society in children, in infants. And so people started asking, why would that be? I mean, they're, they're living in a much more dirty environment in, in terms of um, sterility and, and exposure to stuff. And what it was found uh, is that uh, these, most of these kids have worms. 
And when you examine the worm, and any of us that have been fisher people and have used worms for bait know that the worms are very slimy. <laughs> and so uh, they that slime that they produce is a mucopolysaccharide material that uh, has a unique uh, chemical personality. And it actually influences the immune system. It, it, it trains the immune system. And uh, this is a whole interesting advancing uh, understanding about uh, uh, certain substances that are made by various, in this case, uh, humans, uh, worms, that actually can, can potentiate or um, uh, retrain the immune system uh, and uh, neutralize hypersensitivity. So um, Dr. Baker kind of said, well, we're not going to have, we're, we're not going to feed pathogenic worms to people. That, that's uh, not a good idea. Um, but there are some helmets that are pretty benign that pass through the, uh, the body and don't, you know, uh, induce serious uh, worm, worm related dysfunctions. <laughs> so he started um, really experimenting with this and came up with this concept that uh, he found one family of, of, of worms that would seemingly activate or retrain the immune system, but would not stick around in the body and produce hmm. problems. Hmm. So uh, I think if you go to the literature, because hmm. for a lot of people, this sounds so strange. I mean, just hmm. as fecal transplants sound totally strange to begin with. Now it's being used in many medical centers for Clostridium difficile. Um, so this seems very strange. You give a little worm eggs to, to individuals. But uh, if you actually go to the literature, you're going to find more and more clinical trials uh, actually um, reporting uh, on this as, as being advantaged uh, to improve immune function and to desensitize. So I, I think it's still in the earlier stages of its scientific proof of efficacy and safety, but um, I think I, I would bank on Dr. Baker, who's a brilliant guy, that there's something here of, of mm -hmm. importance. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So in the absence of helmets, um, what can people, what kinds of probiotics would you recommend are the best? You mentioned that for, you know, as people age, they need a, a multiple kind. Do you have any kind of, do you suggest nine different strains, 12 different strains or any particular brands that you think are very, very good that people can look into? Well, I, I would go again with the uh, the clinical research that's been published on the individual brands. The the, the ones that I think are most uh, reproducible in terms of their benefit are, are ones that have been studied and weren't just concocted out of someone's creative mind, but they actually were subjected to clinical trials. Um, I, I am very uh, interested in one bacterium, which I think is uh, uh, coming up in its prevalence of interest, and that's I, I just mentioned it briefly a moment ago, but Acromantia eucinophilia. Um, mm. And we became familiar with that about uh, nearly 20 years ago, I guess, in a discussion with uh, uh, what I think was the father of uh, the term, well, actually, he had coined the term symbiotics. Uh, symbiotics, um, this is Marcel Rubefois, who is uh, now Professor Emeritus at uh, uh, the uh, Catholic University of Louvain in, in Belgium. And um, he, uh, he had two uh, postdocs working in his laboratory that took over his laboratory when he graduated, uh, Nathalie Delzen and Patrice Cani. Uh, Patrice Cani, a, a, a gentleman who is, uh, well, both of them uh, have continued to advance what uh, Dr. Rubafal, Professor Rubafal was working on, but they have discovered all sorts of important things about the microbiome, particularly this bacterium of Acromantium eosinophilia and how it has a favorable effect on all these characteristics of inflammation, insulin sensitivity, uh, body composition, obesity. And um, I, I'm, I, I feel that, uh, in fact, they, their group was one of the first groups that actually in a mouse model was able to show that the microbiome could uh, treat, uh, by improving the microbiome, they could treat obesity. They were one of the first mm -hmm. groups to actually publish mm -hmm. that work. So mm -hmm. I think what we're starting to see now is more and more evidence uh, from good studies going, in, you know, from animals into humans, demonstrating certain species are beneficial. Mm -hmm. And are these, is that particular species available in products that people can uh, yeah, there are, there are certain multiple uh, species products that do have uh, uh, acromantium, mucinophilia in them. 
Um, again, I, I would go back to say, ask the question, what's the clinical data that's been done on that formulation? That's to me the answer. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Now, the other R, the next R. The last one is repair. Uh, and repair really has to do with how we, we recover from a gastrointestinal mucosal injury that's caused leaky gut or associated with dysbiosis. And um, there are many, many uh, tools that can be uh, employed for gastrointestinal restoration. Obviously, the one that a lot of people know is the amino acid L-glutamine, uh, which you know got its uh, favor really out of uh, parenteral nutrition. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, Wegman, in, in his work, which was now over 30 years ago, who is a gastroenterology uh, professor at Harvard, uh, really started using uh, glutamine for the recovery of uh, people's guts that had been on parenteral nutrition for some time and uh, undergone GI atrophy. And, and so we know L-glutamine plays an important role. It actually activates the formation of a very important <clears throat> mucosal protectant agent antioxidant called glutathione, which you probably are well aware of. Mm -hmm. So uh, N-acetylcysteine and, and L-glutamine are both uh, activators of uh, glutathione, which helps to protect and heal the gut mucosa. Um, we also think of um, coenzyme Q10 as being another part of that gut uh, healing antioxidant family. We think of lipoic acid. There's another sulfur-containing phytochemical that's important. We think of the polyphenol family. Again, probably the most important are the anthrocyanidins, uh, these more complex uh, polyphenols that are uh, involved with um, things like uh, oh, one, of the, one of the products that I think is very uh, useful is uh, um, <clears throat> the bark of the uh, maritime pine, um, which is... Um, been used to be high in, <clears throat> in polyphenols. Oh, the psycho, <clears throat> psychogenol or psycho, is it uh, psychogenol or something like that? Isn't there? Uh, um, I, you, you almost have the name right. I always have the name right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, let, let me think now. Pycnogenol. Pycnogenol, uh, uh, that's right. Pycnogenol. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. Good. Okay, so that has, that's maritime bark, is it? Right. Yeah, anything, any, uh, any plant product that's high in these uh, anthrocyanins, these more complex uh, polyphenols, has uh, seemingly a very favorable effect on gastrointestinal restoration and repair. Um, mm. And... Some of those plant is it every plant or just certain plants plant foods that have well they're, they're high they're um, uh, they're high in uh, like uh, you mentioned buckwheat they're high in buckwheat uh, they're high in sorghum uh, so certain of the uh, the seed uh, and nut families are high in anthracyanins particularly in the in the skins of things like almonds and peanuts you've got high levels so. Yeah, I think that uh, there, there are a whole variety of supplements that have been derived out of those foods to concentrate those nutrients. Mm. Mm. Very good. Okay. Now, what about rejuvenate? So we've talked about that, we, and we know the gut is so involved in the immune system. What are some of your thoughts about gut rejuvenation, immune system rejuvenation? Yeah, you know, I think it used to be thought of uh, a little bit like we thought about the brain, the central nervous system, that um, you got your brain cells, and if you damage them, you were never going to get them back. And so, uh, you know, as college students, how many brain cells am I, am I willing to lose on Friday and Saturday nights? And um, <laughs> as, as if those things would never repair themselves. And what we have found uh, over time with the brain is that the brain cells don't repair themselves as quickly as the muscle cells when injured, but they are able to repair themselves. So, uh, you know, we now see that there can be rehabilitation of brain function uh, if it has not been too badly damaged. Um, the, the immune system is, is, uh, is being found to have the same capability. We used to, I think, have this, this uh, thought that the immune system, whatever it was, is what it was, and there was not much we could do about it. Uh, now we recognize that that's completely false, that the immune system 
is uh, is reforming itself on a regular basis. In fact, probably as rapidly or more rapidly than virtually any other tissue or cell system in the body. Just mm -hmm. to give you an idea, every 10 seconds, our immune system uh, produces a, a million new white blood cells, uh, 20 million new red cells, and 30 million new platelets. That's every 10 seconds. So what that means is over the course of about six weeks, on average, a person that's not sick, a, a normal person, healthy person, would basically regenerate their whole of their immune system over the course of the six, six to eight weeks. So the question is, when you're regenerating your immune system, is it exactly the same as where it started? Is it worse than where it started? Or is it better than where it started? <laughs> and, and that's the real interesting question, because rejuvenation then implies that you are able to improve your immune system by taking away bad memories because the immune system remembers things very well. <laughs> it remembers those bad experiences of the infections that you had or the toxins you were exposed to or even the stress, the toxic stress that you're exposed to uh, leaves imprints on your immune system, ghosts. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, will those ghosts live with you for the rest of your life so that you continue to accumulate bad memories on your immune system. And this is what happens to a lot of people as they grow older. They accumulate bad memories in their immune system that then their immune system becomes more and more hostile to them because it's really fighting back against these bad experiences, the accumulated mm -hmm. bad experiences that a person ex had throughout their lifetime. So is there anything you can do about that? And the answer is yes, because the body has the ability to turn back the immune clock to a younger, more naive age. And what you'd like to have are kind of more naive immune cells that come out without the bad memories and are ready to be re-educated as to the new environment that you find yourself in. And that's immunorejuvenation. That's the, the concept that we've been working on now with my group for the last several years. Mm -hmm. And the way that the body does that is through a process that's really only recently been uh, discovered. It won the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology for its discovery, a Japanese investigator, in 2013. It's called autophagy. And autophagy is a process by which the body can selectively eat up things that are damaged. And, and, um, and its companion process is called mitophagy, which is a similar process for the, the mitochondria, which are the energy powerhouse of cells that have to, to get rid of their bad memories as well. And so the combination of autophagy, mitophagy is the way that the, uh, uh, the body can rejuvenate its immune system. And the, again, the exciting part of this is that we're now starting to recognize that there are things that we can do within our lifestyle that activate selective immune cell autophagy, renewal of naive immune cells to get rid of bad memories. And those are things that we all have been studying and unaware of for some time, but now we're seeing much more precision how they work. Things like sleep. <laughs> <laughs> sleep is, is one process that then allows actually enhancement of the autophagy process. Another is time uh, restricted feeding or, um, or uh, uh, periodic fasting or fasting mimicking diets. Uh, that's another thing that leads to uh, immune cell uh, renewal. Uh, another is uh, the use of specific types of foods that are rich in families of these polyphenols that uh, activate the mitophagy autophagy immune process. And that's what led us into Himalayan tartary buckwheat because it turns out that that is the highest uh, of any plant food that we can find that has these uh, actually over 150 different, excuse me, 130 different phytochemicals that are found in tartary buckwheat that actually are all involved as a symphonic orchestration of the autophagy process and leads to immune cell renewal. So this is a, a threshold of a whole new education for us, a whole new clinical frontier for therapeutic nutrition, mm. rejuvenating the immune system. Mm. Wow, and how much of the immune system is in the gut? Well, over 50% uh, of the immune system resides with over 70% of the antibodies that circulate in our blood coming from immune cell activity that's in the gut. Wow. Mm. So we're really talking about, when we're talking about rejuvenating the immune system, we're sort of talking about rejuvenating the gut as well, the most important aspect of the gut. 
Yeah, the, uh, and I think it's interesting that to get a visual kind of picture in our mind that the mucosal cells uh, that line the surface of our uh, intestinal uh, tract, um, on the other side of them is the so-called gastrointestinal associated lymphoid tissue and the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. What those are are the immune system of the body that's sitting just one cell thick layer away from the interior of the gut, all the stuff that passes through it, all the bacteria and all the food and digestive materials. So that immune system is sampling uh, what's going on, but it, it's sampling what is able to be delivered to it from the integrity of the, of the mucosal cells. If the mucosal cells are broken down, that's what we call leaky gut, they lead then to holes that allow more stuff to come in and be exposed to the immune system. Now the immune system can get overloaded with information and it can start into a process saying, hey, that's more information than I really need. I'm going to fight. I'm going to tell the body that we're under siege. We're, we're, we need to, to do battle. Hmm. Wow. So do you find with this Himalayan buckwheat um, that it, uh, it helps restore the immune system lining? Yes, in fact, we uh, just finished a, a clinical experience trial with a group of individuals and uh, who all had, uh, they, they would call themselves uh, not sick, but they would call themselves not completely healthy. So these were people that would be in the kind of aging uh, range uh, between, I think, uh, 37 and uh, 85 uh, was the age range that had, you know, certain signs and symptoms of less than optimal health. And uh, as we, uh, we, we got them into this immune rejuvenation program, which in part it was the, the phytochemicals from Himalayan tartary buckwheat, we had uh, a remarkable significant improvement over the course of um, uh, six weeks. It, and actually it was kind of surprising the extent to which we saw an improvement. It was um, statistically at a level of significance uh, before and after that was greater than, it was less than P001, meaning less than one chance out of a thousand that this was uh, fortuitous that was uh, more of 999 out of a thousand that it was a cause and effect relationship so we, we feel like we're on the edge of, of really some important discoveries about how we can help a person to uh, move their immune system that has a lot of bad memories back to a, a state of, uh, of naivete <laughs> one final question on bad memories um, don't we that doesn't erase uh, good T cell memory, let's say if you had COVID, it won't erase your body's ability to recognize and fight back. Um, that's a really uh, excellent point. Uh, so I think, thank you, that, that, that's really worth talking about. So there are different levels of imprints um, on our immune system uh, that relate to this memory effect. Uh, some are the desirable effects that we have with immunization. Some of our, are those that are induced by exposure to toxic substances that the body is uh, temporarily reacting to. Uh, and some are related to the innate immune system functions that are associated with the macrophages and monocytes and neutrophils. Uh, that's the first line of defense. And some are that are associated with the second line of defense, which are uh, the B and T cells that you mentioned that relate to long-term um, uh, immune defense. The, uh, the, the most active way that you rejuvenate the immune system is through this first level, this innate immune system, the first level of defense, which is not involved with the memory effects. It's really involved with the first line of defense and guard against uh, foreign invaders. So I think your point is very well taken that what we're really rejuvenating is the part of the system that has these bad memories that uh, perpetuates alarm, but not actively involved in reduction of your immune protection against things that uh, you've been immunized against. Oh. Okay. okay. Good. Well, great. Um, final thoughts. Um, if we can just kind of summarize what people should do. And also, if you have particular uh, brands you can recommend more than others that people can go to because people are looking for a blueprint of where to start if they have general gut problems. So we've heard from lots of people on, um, on our two-day seminar about specific issues with the gut. But if you have people who are struggling with a leaky gut or IBS or something like that, so we've talked about some of the testing for allergies and, and heavy metals. Any other tests you would recommend 
any sub general supplements that are going to be really important? And finally, where can they get Himalayan buckwheat? <laughs> um, so the first level on testing, um, I think any uh, high quality laboratory that is doing comprehensive stool testing is a good place to start because even though people don't like to think about their stools, I think you can get a lot of information, both from uh, analyzing the microbiome and then analyzing digestive function. It's, it, you can get two for one from a stool test. And uh, it, it, it may sound unpleasant to some people, but it's really not that complicated and it's fairly simple to do. You don't need a big amount of stool to do these studies. So I, I think that um, I, I would kind of start there. Uh, there are certain specialty tests that one can do within the, the family of stool testing that gives you maybe some increased interrogation uh, specificity. But I, I, would, I would suggest that that's more in the, in the purview of um, health practitioner consults than a person doing kind of their own interpretation. So I, I, I would say, um, Staying with that first level of testing, if you're a consumer, where you, you have a, an interpretation of your microbiome and digestive function is, is probably the place to start with testing. Uh, secondly, with regard to supplements um, and, and places where you can find value, fortunately, over the years, uh, I, I've really seen a rising of the tide of high quality supplements being produced. In, the, in, in my earlier years, uh, now going back 40 years ago, uh, there was a lot of um, poor quality control within the dietary supplement field and and there were a lot of exaggerated claims made and there were a lot of things that were said about certain supplements that tr turned out not to be true and there are there were a lot of people that were producing supplements that didn't have really reproducible quality I think that that has really improved over the years and staying with national brands that have good clinical trial studies on their ingredients um, uh, you know that fortunately now we have a pretty good array of those companies that can be selected and then it comes down to customer service and it comes down to you know price point variability and certain things that individuals might like as some companies are really better on customer service and and education than others so I think that becomes part of the story because a person likes to be able to think they can either go to the internet and find an answer to something or call up somebody and get a technical answer from a well-trained individual um, as it relates to the tartary buckwheat, um, I, I would urge people who are interested in seeing our story as it relates to some immune rejuvenation to go to uh, uh, the website um, Big Bold Health, www.bigboldhealth. Um, uh, we're, we're putting together what we call a community. That's a, a, a community of immune interested people. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's our community. And uh, we, we're, we're publishing a lot of research. Uh, we're publishing a lot of uh, information about the immune system and, and also the tartary buckwheat story. So I think Big Bold Health uh, would be a, a good place for a person to start. And so, that's uh, bigboldhealth.com? Yes, www.bigboldhealth.com. Yes. And is, are they able to get tartary buckwheat from there or buckwheat tartary? Yeah, uh, yeah we, we have, the, we have uh, Himalayan tartary buckwheat uh, that we've... Took us uh, two years, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm now in farming. I never thought I'd be a farmer, but uh, I'm partnered with uh, an extraordinary uh, individual. Uh, he and his wife, uh, he was an ag uh, agricultural professor at Cornell University, uh, which is a very well-known university in the United States. Uh, he retired. He wanted to do something. He and his wife was a former nurse uh, that would be fun to do on their little family farm in upstate New York. So they uh, were able to find these, uh, these seeds that were uh, from... Uh, the Himalayan district of, uh, of China that um, he started growing on six acres on his little family farm. He was the only, we found out, the only person in the United States that was growing Himalayan tartary buckwheat. We formed a partnership with him. We then recruited other organic farmers, and we now have the first uh, organically certified regenerative agriculture produced Himalayan tartary buckwheat in the United States. Never been done before. So that took us two years because we had to grow our own seeds. You can't go to the seed store and buy them. Uh, yeah. And and so now we, we actually have several hundred thousand pounds of, of uh, Himalayan tartary buckwheat. Wonderful. Hmm. And that would be able to be shipped over to the UK for people who are interested as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, that's been remarkable, Jeff. I, before we went on there, I described you as a legend and 
You've demonstrated <laughs> it. You've demonstrated it yet again. I feel I deserve a degree after this. I think it's been <laughs> so wide ranging and exhaustive. It's phenomenal. And well, well, thank you. I you know, I, 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 yeah. I just want to make sure that um, that uh, people who are listening or watching uh, uh, understand that uh, I, I'm a good chronicler. I think of things that I've learned from many other pioneers and and uh, people that have really been moving this field forward. We, we mentioned a number of names over the course of this discussion who are people that I've learned from or been part of my, my uh, uh, peer group. Uh, but I, I certainly haven't named all the individuals that affected me. And, and I think I'm a good uh, uh, chronicler of uh, a lot of extraordinary work and pioneering work and sometimes working uphill and working at peril because some of these new ideas were not always well accepted and yeah. people got themselves into criticism. And uh, I feel very privileged to, you know, I had the privilege of spending two years with uh, Dr. Linus Pauling, two-time Nobel Prize winner yeah. in, uh, in 81 to 83. I was uh, running his, uh, one of his research labs at Stanford on sabbatical as a professor. And um, that was a life-changing experience for me to be able to see what it takes to mm -hmm. advance an idea that's not popular at the time. You just have to stick with it and continue to do diligence. And you sometimes have to have thick skin because you're going to be criticized. <laughs> oh, we know. Well, we, we think know. you're a bit more than a chronicler, Jeff. Yes. But uh, We've been following uh, your work for 30 your years. Your name is on the lips of most everyone we speak uh, to, so I think... Yeah. A bit more than that, but but bless you and thank you so much. It was wonderful, wasn't it? It was wonderful.